I guess, I guess to next, as long as we're all sharing this. Um, so yeah, the agenda, as I said um, before being cut off a couple of times is just, I think refining virtual events, perhaps not so much tidying up as just um, getting them nailed down a little bit more clearly with a bit of experience under the hood. Um, so most of these proposals are things that uh, showed up in the previous call. Uh, there's the question, I think, still of guidance for virtual and on-demand events. And when I say guidance, I mean what should be recommended, what should be required, uh, what optional, and so on and so forth. Um, and the question of maximum virtual attendee capacity and remaining virtual attendee capacity, I believe we resolved that last call. I was again cut off at the end of it. Uh, but my understanding is that that was resolved but actually further reflection over the course of the week subsequent led to a reversion to uh, the earlier proposal. Uh, so let's just re-examine that and make sure we're all on the same page there. Um, there's a new proposal, uh, which is donation payment URL, reflecting the fact that a lot of classes in the SOC sector um, are no longer charging, but still request donations from participants in order to keep themselves financially viable. Uh, the other one, uh, which was a late addition as of last night, um, is the question of minimal requirements for things such as uh, training, insurance, and music licensing also came up in the last two weeks. And we should address that over the course of the call if we can as well. Um, so there's the introduction. Uh, Nick, if you could move us on to the next slide, please. So, Yes, the question is, um, which fields are required, recommended, or optional for virtual events and um, uh, streaming events and uh, recorded events? Um, I don't think we really attained a resolution of this last time. I think that was left up in the air. Um, So we've had a few proposals made in the last think, two weeks. Yeah, I think that the reason for this uh, agenda point is most likely because of the um, the additional comments on this on this particular thread, that issue comment there. Mm -hmm. So I just bring that up here. Um, basically, the, the there's a there's an additional organizer ID, um, which has uh, now been moved to required, and gender restriction was also accidentally omitted. And so I think those two things, further to what we discussed before, which is to kind of go back up here and show you that, that's just that gender restriction is in recommended, um, and that organizer there is, is in required uh, with the ID of the organizer. Um, right, okay. Um, is, is, there, is there always an organizer known for an on-demand session? Sorry, this is for uh virtual events oh well, okay so that's distinct from on demand although that's a good point so it's, it's, it's for both it's for it's for both uh, you're you're absolutely right sorry it's for both yeah so that that's the question for an on-demand mm -hmm. event doesn't always have a known organizer right that's a really good point so the rational rationale behind this um was the ability for um, those organizations that have got requirements to um, have some kind of approval process where they approve certain content and not other content and that approval um, in the safeguarding stuff is through the ID matching of the ID so the idea is that and this is specifically come from Sport England um, so whether this stays as required is a good question maybe it just drops to be recommended but certainly the idea with it um, being expedited to required for the Sport England requirement was if everything has an ID, then if you're happy with, um, sorry, if, if um, in the Sport England campaign, for example, but others obviously would be able to do the same, um, that, that there's a particular organiser that has produced content that looks like it's um, of reasonable quality, that you can approve that organiser and all of their content which you won't be able to do if there's not a unique ID for the organizer. So, um, and the organizer means the organizer within the system rather than, I guess, the originator of the content. So, for example, in Playways, the person that is, um, I guess, uh, yeah. the content. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one, actually, because we, we've been uh, scratching our heads around the uh, safeguarding uh, subject recently. Um. I mean, I think, given that the safeguarding proposal is only at the level of a proposal um, and is not going to be entering the specification anytime soon, I wonder if it's premature to make that required at this point. Yeah, that the, the, yeah, exactly. The, well, the reason the reason for that was just in, if whatever the safeguarding, I guess whatever it looks like, and however we tag the organisers with some type of like this organiser's fine, we'll still need to identify them somehow. Um, but but yeah, I mean it's 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 kind of a yeah. I mean, I think mm, I, I don't want to get into I don't I don't want to get into the safeguarding proposal too much. Um, but I think given, yeah, that, it, that it's still a proposal, I'm not too sure that mechanism is necessarily going to be that workable. Even if it goes into the standard, there's still a sort of infrastructure that has to be created. Um, so I think for immediate purposes, I'd say, let's just keep it as, as a recommendation rather than a requirement. Um, obviously it's a pain if we then bump it up to required subsequently, but then we can issue guidance about how to derive identifiers in cases where we don't have them. Um, yeah, I think we can, we can, I think we can kick that can down the road a little bit there. Yeah, sure. Maybe we'll uh, maybe we, we put it in recommended with a note saying that certain organisations such as Sport England uh, will require this, but it's not in the spec yeah. as required. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, okay, and then yeah, so so I suppose that leaves um, gender restriction as the other one that just didn't make it in. Um, well, it was just yeah, it was just it was simply just the last video call we had. We had the uh, went through the list here, and it just wasn't in there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so, so the reason it's there is just simply because, as it uh, says somewhere further up, um, that these have all come from the existing modelling specification. So the existing <laughs> modelling specification has that. So we're just inheriting the right. required status of it. Oh, sorry, recommended status of it. Okay. So um, I guess unless anybody has any strong uh, resistance to that. Um, this, that's really just an administrative uh, amendment. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. Let's carry on then um, to the next proposal. Oh, I think it's this one. Uh, yeah. So are you still screen sharing? Oh, can you not see that? Um, I can see it. Okay, yeah, I can see it now, yeah. Uh, virtual attendee capacity. Okay, so this went around the houses last call, right? And I think it ended up being actually on the, was it the virtual location it ended up getting attached to? Yeah. Um, yeah. However, if we follow the thread through, I think that was found to be problematic. Um, yeah. And I think we reverted to the original proposal, which was just to treat it as analogous to um, attendee capacity and maximum attendee capacity. Um, I guess the question is, actually, this is one, this is a useful question for people who are already implementing. Um, is this being represented in your data feeds already? And if so, how? Josh, do you know the answer to that? I'm sorry, I just got uh, pinged. I wasn't paying attention for a second. <laughs> yeah, I think we're all in that position. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so the, the, the original proposal um, two weeks ago was to have maximum virtual attendee capacity and um, remaining virtual attendee capacity for, for virtual events which makes sense in a way because we already have attendee capacity, uh, maximum attendee capacity and remaining attendee capacity for physical location events. So then the two are just analogous to each other. Um, however, in the course of the discussion last time in which I could participate only intermittently, um, I think in, it was actually seen as residing better on the virtual location as a kind of limitation on say the Zoom link or whatever, rather than as a limitation on the event itself. Um, 
However, we had some tooling properties with that because of the way that that ends up getting nested. And it also doesn't play very nicely with this way schema.org looks at these things. So I think we sort of looped back to the original position, which was these are just properties of the event, but because they're labeled virtual, um, it's clear that it refers to the virtual location rather than to the physical location, um, which is more consistent with the way schema.org does things. Um, so I guess the question is, are people using maximum virtual attendee capacity or something similar in their feeds? And if so, where are they putting that right now? Right. Um, uh, for us, we aren't really um, using it so much. Okay. It's, it's rarer that a virtual capacity is set, certainly than a, a physical one. Mm -hmm. um, but they also only have one, there's only one virtual location, so it doesn't matter where the virtual capacity is, if you see what I mean. It doesn't, doesn't really affect our use case as is at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, does anybody from IMIN have any views on this? We haven't really seen it in anyone's feeds yet, so we haven't had any chance to use it. Um, and I don't know if the, on the broker side if anyone's sort of um, uh, experienced enough to inquire about it. I guess it depends on the instructors. If we have no instructors that are really using playways or other systems that have the need for to limit virtual capacity, then we might we just haven't come across those instructors yet, I guess. Right, okay. Um, so at the at the moment this is kind of um, this is kind of an academic point then at the moment. Um, so Nick, what what's the exact nature of the tooling difficulty here? So um, the problem is that the um, the the virtual location is it's in is in a beta property, mm -hmm. which we've called uh, was it beta virtual location i think um and then and then because the virtual location is in a beta property what that means is that if we were going to put maximum attendee capacity on virtual location that becomes a nested beta property within a beta property right um which is uh yeah creates some uh bizarre uh, uh interactions with the various tools uh yeah i guess it, it, in theory it should work but it's just like an extra level of i guess something that no one thought about being mm -hmm. a thing um, so there's, there's that, that's one of the uh, angles and the other angle is that there's a it creates a dependency between implementation of one and implementation of the other mm -hmm. right okay yeah because they're quite different actually the virtual location is a url that you're kind of saying this is where you can access the thing which if you've got a paywall in place you might not be supplying um because it's it's, it's private you need to get go through the booking process and you get that at the other end whereas um, the maximum virtual attendee capacity is actually a, a property you would be using for filtering. For example, um, I'm looking for classes where there's about 10, 15 people rather than 100, 200 people. So I might be looking for small classes, in which case you can filter on that. Um, those two properties. So the, the current um, the discussion last time was uh, concluded with we don't want to implement remaining attendee capacity because that's really complicated and unnecessarily confusing because we've already got mechanisms around. Um, sorry, remaining virtual attendee capacity, we don't want to implement because we've already got mechanisms around remaining attendee capacity. So let's not try and confuse it by adding an extra property. The maximum might be useful because of the filtering thing, mm -hmm. um, because that's that's what that's for. Um, so potentially that's where we, we, we would add it so that we could at least do filtering. And so that was the intention, but then we kind of said, well, if we're gonna put it in, we'll just put it in only for that and not make it, um, kind of tie it into the booking spec or anything else that we might want to try and connect together because it's really just for filtering. Um, but the, the thing is, if we're going to have it in the event and not in, in the virtual location, then it doesn't really make sense to have it as a beta property because it exists in the namespace already because of schema. So at which point we're kind of at the point where it's, well, we might as well just use schema because it's there. Um, we, we may choose not to really make use of that in the booking spec later on or um, uh, give it any special um, uh, meaning in terms of how it connects to other properties that we've defined. But um, 
but yeah, it's and also the if we if we put it in the beta namespace, it would duplicate schema, which is not something we we've right. Done. No, yeah, okay. That and, would, yeah. And, and also not something the tooling necessarily supports in some cases as well. So there's like that angle. Okay. Um, I mean, I think given that it doesn't look like we're breaking anything, um, certainly doesn't look like there's been a, a rush to implement based on the discussion last two weeks ago. Um, and given the complexity, and I think also just given, frankly, the kind of unpredictable messiness of moving these two into location, when I think if you were approaching it from a schema.org perspective, you'd clearly expect it to be on event. Um, I think probably we should resolve the issue as it stands right now with the updated proposal that you made 13 days ago. Yeah. Uh, so unless we have any strong objections there, uh, shall we continue on? Yep. Um, I think this one is, is quite a simple one. Um, and this is simply because so many people are now soliciting donations rather than strictly speaking charging for participation in an event. Um, it's obviously helpful to be able to point people to the service such as PayPal or whatever that you're using to get those donations. Um, so this is a very simple proposal um, to add donation payment URL, uh, the value of which would be a URL. Um, and that would just take you to the location where you could, you could donate to the organization or the instructor in question. Um, it seems fairly simple and straightforward. Nick's already done the work of adding that to the beta namespace. Um, so so uh, would, would the idea there be then that on a, you know, on an open data finder, I find a session and in the details of that session, there would be a URL for me to click and go through and make a payment, a donation. Yeah, is that, exactly. is, that's how it would work. Yeah. yeah, like a, like a donate PayPal. I don't know if you've seen them on the on other websites where you yeah. just the donate button and you press it and you end up at PayPal. Okay, it just see it just think of the the, the sort of the, the user flow there because what I'm probably going to do is is find the session. I'm then going to to book onto the session, and then I may probably only decide to make a donation after I've attended the session. By which time, if it's in the finder, it may well have dropped off because we're not showing sessions that are in the past. I mean, it's probably the way that Playways would do it would be to have a, you know, an option to say, you know, make an optional payment because in, in our booking flow from somebody, you know, booking on to a, a physical or virtual session, they go through a, a, a booking process that if we were to implement a, 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 you know, a donation payment option alongside our standard payment option, um, th what would be more useful to us there would be a Boolean as well as URL. Right, yes, because you're basically saying that donations are available but, but through your, your mechanism. But, yes, that's right, yeah. It just, it just seems that the use case of attending a session and having to go, because you're unlikely to make a donation before going on the session, I would have thought. Yeah, but Rupert, I think I think there is some, some use case here where, for example, if you put the donation URL in the confirmation email or something like that, or the or the thanks for attending email, then at least um, yeah, at least they have access to it as a as a consumer. Yeah, You're right, I, they may not do it on the way through. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I could see, you know, I'm not suggesting replace donation payment URL with a Boolean. I, I'm suggesting that a, a, a Boolean would also be useful so that you could incorporate donation payments into a booking flow um, sure. rather than do it through a URL. Because if you put a URL into a booking flow and somebody clicks on it, you're sort of taking them away from that booking flow as well, like. <clears throat> um, that's a really good point. I guess, yeah, that, that's true. This the, the, the intention with this was was more around the free sessions, which don't have a booking flow, um, whether it's kind of already on whatever. Um, yeah, already... because well, we 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 have th uh, three types of of well, four really uh, types of sessions we have on demand. 
large. We have live streaming non-bookable. We have live streaming bookable, and we have live streaming bookable and payable. Mm. <clears throat> so mm -hmm. the, the, <laughs> this would sort of add a fifth one: live streaming, um, uh, uh, bookable, and donatable. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's interesting. Well, so I, I mean, to bring in um, another example, actually, but book when, uh, similar to what you're suggesting there, we put, uh, have a, a donate as part of the booking process. You can kind of go in and um, and do that yeah. as a separate thing, or or even not. I mean, because if you if it's a donate and it's a free session, then you're getting the access to the session before you necessarily go through a booking flow anyway, um, and so then you you're. Yeah. So then I guess the URL becomes the book when URL, which is the way of getting to the um, the donation flow. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, for, for us, I'm just thinking the way our payment system is, is structured it, it, because we have a sort of top up capability in, in, in our uh, payment system that this would actually be really nice and neat and easy for us to do um, by just saying, while you're booking it you know this is free but if you'd like to make a couple of quid donation please put two in the box and press pay um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that would be quite easy for us to do it'd be quite a neat a neat way of doing it uh but for all we need to know is is this something that you want to take ask for donations for that would be a boolean yeah boolean makes sense so if you got if you had a boolean then i guess you would that would allow you to display also in the finder that donations are yeah because yeah. I, I guess that's the the interesting information is less uh, i guess in the finder stage is less what where you go to make the donation and more that actually that you can yeah um and i suppose if that is a clickable button where it says donations accepted um is is when it would be a url but then if it may just say donations accepted without the clickable in which mm. case it's a boolean i guess yeah I, I can see donation payment url it, it may be also more applicable for on demand which clearly doesn't have a, a, a booking process but you know <clears throat> if i'm watching joe wicks every week and you know he puts a donate um button on his um session i might choose to donate and I, for that i'll use the url so i think the url is absolutely relevant but it would also so be we, nice to just have a boolean so do we just want something like donation payment available as a complement to this property that would i would agree with that yeah yeah okay i think uh i think that makes that makes sense that that would also yeah accommodate a wider variety help people out um mm -hmm. i think the only other question i had with this um property was i suppose you do want to know under some circumstances what the payment service actually is like whether it's apple pay or whether it's paypal i guess you can get that information uh just by parsing the url but it seemed a yes. little messy uh, that's interesting yeah so schema does this in other places and it's the approach that um that seems to make sense for virtual location as well in terms of the service so for example the same as property in schema which is used for social media handles so it doesn't, it just has a list of, it's literally an array of URLs and you put your Facebook and your Twitter and your whatever handles in there. And obviously then you're just expected as a consumer to parse Facebook's URL and go, that's probably Facebook. And mm -hmm. then you don't need to maintain a separate kind of uh, list somewhere of all of the potential um, standard names for each of the services, which I guess you would need to do otherwise. Um, so you you just then end up with a yeah you just end up with it being in the URL. So I guess in a similar way here you could parse it for PayPal, you could parse it for something else. But I guess if someone entered a service that was totally new, you wouldn't then know the name of it. Um, yeah, it would be a. I'm just wondering. Yeah, does it make it irritatingly complex to add a label to this field um, or same as? Well, what I'm. I guess what I'm wondering from a practical perspective is if you've got some known services, you might have that designed into your yeah. experience. Like if you want a popular PayPal color, you know, like graphic on the PayPal link, you might want to say donate with PayPal. Um, if it's an unknown and random service, then maybe the benefit of having the name is, I mean, it's just a, yeah. it's just a donate URL. So maybe at that point you've just got a donate button in your, in your UI rather than having the name there. 
Okay. Um, yeah, let's let's leave it as is then. I think that's right. I also think it's a, probably an edge case. Most people are going to be on one of the, what, two or three big platforms for this kind of thing. So, okay. Um, so let's add uh, donation payment available. Um, uh, would uh, Joshua, would you be happy to add that as a, as a GitHub proposal? What, what exactly? Uh, the donation. Which part? The, the Boolean, you mean? The Boolean, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Just because right. it seems a little weird, like I'd be happy to do it, except then it's like sort of, I appear as the person responsible for initiating. <laughs> You're asking yourself for something, yeah. Makes yeah, sense. exactly, yeah. <laughs> Which I do a fair bit, but yeah. Um, it seems more uh, correct to have, to have uh, your organization doing it. Thank you. Um, okay, I guess let's carry on to the next point, which I think is probably the most complicated, unfortunately, of them. Uh, this emerged, I think, fairly recently over the course of the last week, um, which is there are certain legal um, and commercial requirements that sometimes need to be met. And it would be good to be able to indicate that these conditions have been met in the data itself. Uh, the three use cases that have come up have been uh, music licensing. Uh, so this is mostly relevant to streaming services where music that's copyrighted, I think Zumba is the case in, is the most frequent case in point here. Um, obviously, if you're licensed to play it within a particular physical location, that's not a problem. But once you start streaming it out, of course, you're sharing it with a uh, dog plus world. Um, questions of insurance and questions of instructor qualifications. Um, I think the original proposal that was just kind of roughed out um, in the uh, open active Slack was to have a, a Boolean kind of saying various um, qualifications have been met. Um, but then further discussions seem to tease those out into three separate concerns that were just listed. Um, so while it would be possible to have one blanket kind of uh, T's and C's checkbox, it might be useful to make it more fine grained. Um, all of about 15 minutes before this call, I wrote up a new issue to address this. Um, so my proposal has actually been to have a generic kind of uh, property um, called something like minimal requirement, which would have a name, uh, a URL, which would be pointing to a description of the requirement and how it's met by the organization, and then a Boolean field indicating whether it's met or not. Um, that was as simple as I could break it down based on the use cases that had emerged so far. And I can imagine that the use cases that have emerged are not comprehensive. Um, on the other hand, I can also see the argument that this is perhaps too complex and that providing all of this information is going to be a burden on systems. Um, but if anybody has first impressions, I'd be grateful to hear them. Uh, first thing I'd point out is that uh, having a music license is not a just a yes or no because mm -hmm. your video may not have music in it. So you, you know it, you, there is a, a not required right okay <laughs> on, on, on music. Um, I, I, I yeah I mean the the idea of someone so so so, so in Playways you know as someone creates a session they fill out you know plenty of data already and that that is 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 growing the, the more you know um open data requirements that we put into playways uh this is um um it feels like it's relatively onerous for for users to if they if they have to put in a url to their their six year old um uh, license, instructor license, or write a description. Uh, writing a description. I mean, I just wonder how, how that's going to be used. Uh, My understanding of how it's used is that it's kind of specifically for the Sport England campaign and that they want to be able to have some control over the quality. I think they could describe it as like the, the quality and the yeah. qualifications of the people who are, they might want to showcase on their website. And I think they were speaking to Simspur and EMD around what is that kind of minimum requirement and it, and it was those kind of things of insurance licensing and um, 
yeah, basically they wanted a, a way for the systems to be able to, whether it's just someone self-certifying that they've got those in place mm. or because I mean, we said that we don't think we'll have the, the capacity. We don't want to be checking any insurances and I don't think we've got a system set up where we could compare that to an existing list. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. I mean, when I, I first saw this, I, I, I envisaged it as being, uh, you know, I, I declare uh, that I have the requisite insurance. Uh, I, if I'm playing music, I have the requisite license um, and I have the requisite training. Um, uh, and that's you know, an easy structured piece of data to to filter out those that say no to any of those. Um, uh, obviously, people can tick those regardless uh, if they're that way inclined. Um, but having having a URL and or a description of your music license, your insurance policy, etc. It's sort of creating more onerous input for people, and also I just I can't see how how that piece of data, that extra piece of data, would be could be used because if they don't have the capacity to go through and actually check those URLs or those licenses, then it's it's sort of creating more input that is not really going to add any value to anything. Okay. Uh, um... So you are. Uh, so is this just a question of guidance? Do you think? Um, so I mean, I think generally speaking, the field as a whole would be optional, um, simply because, as you say, sometimes you know credentials aren't relevant, uh, in which case just don't supply them. Um, is it a question of maybe making name and boolean required because otherwise it really is kind of meaningless and URL optional, or do you think URL is just entirely redundant? I think it's redundant if it's not going to be used. Uh, I, you know, I know this has come from Sport England. I mean, if Sport England are going to be using that extra data to to verify, maybe they are. What's the actual use case here? I guess, like, like is my question. Like, what what are we? What are they actually trying to? Is it because the reason it, the reverse would be that you only have a URL, but that URL is actually hard coded into the booking systems, if you see what I mean. So, so playways. Uh, asks the question if it's a tick box which literally says have you got blah 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 whatever the blah is that question is a defined question that someone has des decided is the right legal wording or whatever it is that legal wording has a url so actually what you're doing is saying um that as a booking system i put this statement in um a bit like when you reference the creative commons license you know you reference the license and say someone's accepted this license this is the URL of the license. So the reason that you put the URL in the data is actually not for the user to see the URL or anything to do with that. It would be to, um, as a way of just um, having a, a easy machine readable definition of the words, that the words which are then in the user interface. Um, and maybe those, maybe the, the um, URL itself also resolves to some more details. So for example, if the URL says, um, I agree that I've got music license, da, 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 more details here and click that and you go to the URL, which is the same URL. And that takes you to the EMD guidance, which has got, you know, a page of stuff. Um, but you've still agreed generally to the EMD page and the specific summary that's defined there. Um, and then, so you're literally then, if that's the case, you're literally saying then URL tick and you don't have any other free text in there. I've just gone back to what, um, Francis from Sport England said originally, which was, she thinks Simsbur and EMD are doing a, a web page which will have guidance around all areas related to insurance licensing requisite qualifications. And she said, what is the way that your you could basically get assurance from your instructors, providers via a tick box or similar that they've ad adhered to these requirements? So that I mean that sounds like it's almost putting those three things together. And it is just that one, there will be one web page, which is if the person says, yes, we meet these criteria, tick yes. Right, so these are, yes, here's the T's and C's that you've signed up to, tick. Here's yeah. The, the lot, right, okay. Um, I, I can see that that works where it's a, um, you know, a single provider source such as EMD, but on Playways, it's a case that, you know, there's a, a a wide diversity of of instructors uh, adding content for a, a wide diversity of 
virtual sessions. Um, so whereas one sort of requisite license may be relevant in one instance, may be completely irrelevant in another. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it'd be a challenge for us. Well, we wouldn't be able to do it really. Mm. I think I think in this case, um, there's an especially heightened b uh, bar to get over for brokers to show the data because there's this, there's just more scope for um, uh, accidents to happen for people who aren't because uh, anyone can publish any session basically on YouTube well Facebook Live um, and uh, they, anyone can log into those so there's no like physical sort of check of people walking into the class it being a legit class um, and someone then kind of making sure that they can see people and they're not doing anything dangerous. So there's, a, there's kind of a heightened bot around this stuff. So I think there's, there's like a, a line we can, we can um, a circle we can draw around, which is around a, a particular type of activity, which fine might be the EMD type, but for Sport England, that's at least the type they're showing mm -hmm. for now. So EMD covers exercise, movement and dance. So it's, it's quite a broad range of stuff already. Mm -hmm. um, and as Chris was saying, there's the use case currently is there's, there's two stage gates to get um, classes visible on, on the Sporting Man campaign, which is the feed that we, the data feed um, source. So, you know, playways or open sessions or EMD. Do they have um, like requisite stage gates in place um, that they've done enough to, to check that instructors are, are self declaring they have what they need to have? And the second is, do we think those, those, um, classes are of high enough production value, which is a bit more of a subjective thing. That's what England will, will check on their end. So for, for, for feeds like um, our parks, they're going to kind of broadly uh, approve the organizer because it's just one type of organizer coming to that feed. But it's for feeds like, like your own uh, Rupert and open sessions where, <clears throat> as you said, there could be a variety, but for the first group of, of the kind of sessions they're showing, they need a way to say, Okay, well, within Playways, we know that they've got a tick box on the relevant pages for the relevant kind of providers, and those those things are being ticked, uh, and we can either pick up in the feed, or we can tell I'm in to do something about it, kind of manually to begin with. I imagine there's going to be more um, requirements that emerge as as we go through this campaign because Sport England talking to to Simspo talking to EMD and everyone's looking at each other trying to figure this out. Um, so they've only got one thing to point at, at the moment, which is the thing that's on the EMD website. Um, so I, I wonder if we need to pair this down a bit and try and scope it to what we know, knowing that stuff's going to emerge in the future that will potentially allow us to include other types of providers or have a bit more granular detail of what's actually required, you know, like URLs and stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, my feeling from what you just said, Nish, is actually that so the proposal can kind of stand, actually. The problem is that it's too capacious and too onerous, um, but that actually those kinds of requirements might emerge over time. Um, and if we keep the guidance fairly minimal in terms of what's required, um, that gives us the pared down kind of version that's actually usable now. Mm -hmm. But keeping an optional URL field allows us to expand it out to cover uh, yeah, a wider variety of use cases. Well, well I was actually thinking the, okay. the inverse of that. Mm -hmm. Funnily, funnily enough, classic. Um, that which was the um, that w maybe we just need an array of URLs. Um, building on what I, um, I was saying earlier around referencing guidance, because ultimately, if what I'm saying is that EMD's got a URL right now, and that's the thing everyone's pointing at, mm -hmm. then really all we're doing is someone's ticking a box to say that they've. Um, you know, they've self-certified against that URL. Therefore, that adds the URL to the array. Um, if you don't tick the box, you don't have it in the array. Um, and it's kind of, and therefore, we've really got like a minimal amount of stuff that we've added to the spec here to, to, to kind of deal with what we know. Um, and in the future, you can add more URLs for different activity types. And obviously, it will be on the booking system to present the relevant tick box. Uh, as Rupert pointed out, it's going to be for Playways. Obviously, if you've got EMD, classes in there, you're going to want to present them with the EMD tick box. But what if you don't? What if you have all sorts of other things in there that aren't that? Um, but then I don't know if, yeah, yeah, you know, painting class. Um, I, think, I think I think an array of URLs makes sense. I actually don't think there is a, a URL yet anyway. 
because the EMD one at the moment is, is specific for um, you agree to EMD's terms and conditions and all that kind of stuff, which wouldn't be relevant if you were kind of pointing at it from playways. There might be a generic one that's created, um, and that's what we're talking to, to Sims Responsible for England about. Um, but I think having an, a field there that's optional that allows for an array gives us the most flexibility in the future to, to, to move forward. And, and if stuff comes and we can fit into that structure, then that's great. But if stuff comes that doesn't, then we can have another one of these calls and figure it out. But right, right now we don't know. Okay. Um, it, it seems like a pain on the data consumer side um, to be parsing this, an array of URLs, or it assumes that you've got a lot of sector knowledge about how you parse those URLs and what they mean. Oh, I was expecting it to be more a filter. So you're literally, if you're a data consumer, you're literally saying that I accept the following URLs, you know, just as, as they're, they're opaque, just like. Yeah, that would be user facing. Right, right. I, th I think what that limits is the ability to say, here are the kinds of information that's available to you, make your own judgment. Um, I think that's, that's the difficulty. Um, but yeah, this is, this is kind of hypothetical systems I'm thinking of at the moment, I suppose. Well, that's exactly the challenge because if it, 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 to give that more detailed level of make your own judgment, we are going to have to define a lot of what that looks like. Yeah. It sounds like we really don't, I mean, it's even the insurance licensing training stuff that we've got at the moment is all very like, we've just, you know, we've made that up. That's not, you know, yeah. I feel like there's a, there's a whole process to go through. Um, Whereas if we kind of take it back to back a level, maybe, I mean. Yeah, no, that's fine. I think maybe I'm over influenced when I was writing this. I've just been working on safeguarding stuff, which is much, much more formalized. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was maybe presupposing a more defined landscape than there actually is. Um, okay, so let's take this back then to array of URLs. That sounds like the minimum everyone can agree on. Um, but yeah, as, as Nish says, with an asterisk beside it for you know, further work in future. Does that sound like a reasonable, um, workable compromise for everyone? Yep. Okay. Sounds good to me. All right, the URLs, great, thank you. Um, so that takes us to the end of everything on the agenda. Um, we've only got seven minutes left on the call, um, but I was wondering if we could devote at least part of that to experiences people have had implementing and what, um, what ex people's experiences have been working with data providers and with classes over the last couple of weeks? How's the sector been doing and what requirements are emerging? Uh, from from uh, our very early experience, uh, it's something I've discussed with uh, Nish just this morning, actually. It's around um, uh, the on-demand piece. So, for example, we had um, the Active Wellbeing Society in Birmingham um, go live with a finder, and uh, they the, the most of their content is is on demand content uh, simply because they had a lot of it and it's expedient for them to get it onto their finder. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they sort of we, we have a toggle on the finder to move between on demand and uh, and live streaming that data is just coming through our playways sort of our, our sort of playways private open data feed um, um, so and I, I think Charlie if, if he's still on the call has said that there are other clients that are you know leaning towards you know starting out with with on demand um, yeah, so, uh, yeah. Let me. I, I, I can probably build on that. This is this is high level and and could probably change as we hit uh, hit a greater scale because we're working with very spotlighted in, spotlighted occurrences at the moment, which might be giving us a sort of um, a slightly uh, warped view. What what I would say where where we're seeing um, the activity provider or deliverer sitting in probably the, the EMD space, um, if it's exercise, movement, and dance, I think there's a far greater logic behind. Um, Behind the live, behind a live delivery. So in that in that uh, arena, there is a lot more um, live data available. Equally, a lot of the providers in that space are who have already moved uh, are obviously the larger providers, and, and they probably won't 
in, at least initially engage in the open active piece um they, they won't sense the benefit of it but the smaller providers and the individuals perhaps uh, when you move outside of that so Ruth there's mentioned active well-being um if we looked at what look at what the active partnership network are doing um, and individual active partnerships and then in the the he space with universities they, they they don't have quite the same ability or or instructor availability to to immediately create live stream content um, and have so their their resource bank of uh, on demand is greater they can they can rely on existing um, or create new with what they have so there is going to be a wealth of great initially a, a wealth more of um, of on demand content in, in everywhere outside of that fitness space um, mm -hmm. but that trend might change that might just be the initial initial leverage because they've got access to things much more easily and it's easier to share and uh can you speak to any particular pain points people have had in that process i'm thinking technically at this point rather than uh you know sector wide i i can't think of anything specifically that's jumping out if i'm honest um I don't think it's ne there's necessary. I think technically everything's available to them. Mm -hmm. um, I think general knowledge of the available tools is reasonable. People all seem to always have a go-to, whether it's Facebook or Zoom or, or Google Hangouts. Um, they sort of know of at least one. Um, and from a from a creation of um, content perspective, I mean, I think the biggest challenge we've all got is again going to be an awareness piece. There's, I think there's plenty of people who know that they can move to delivering online and delivering it that to their known network. Mm -hmm. um, but to know that they can publish that out via this mechanism uh, is probably the awareness isn't there at the lower level. Um, right. So it, without, without drumming up that awareness, um, I don't think we're going to have loads of people come at us for it. Like how would they know what we're, we're all doing? We're a bit of a, it could be that we're a bit of a hidden community to, to that audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did a webinar for instructors last week and there was loads and loads of interest in kind of how to use Zoom, how to use Facebook Live, what's the in, in equipment you might need, what's the setup, um, the the kind of promotion bit of it was was kind of, I talked about Open Active, but it wasn't like the, their top concern. They were looking probably more at kind of fully integrated systems where they could just do their booking and then stream as well. That, that seemed to be of interest to them. Um, I guess the... Yeah, the, the stuff that we heard from them was just that kind of technical, how do I actually do this? Uh, or they've tried it and it didn't work. Um, and they've had lots of issues with trying to get their, their participants to take part in it. Um, so it was really around that that issue that, that we saw. Um, I guess the, the, another thing, I, I don't know if this even comes into this kind of discussion at all, but we've got some concerns around how like uh, accessible this is gonna be to the kind of wider population in terms of streaming. Are we going to end up after this initial kind of focus and then we've just got uh, um, quite people who are already active accessing these kind of opportunities and, and, and are we going to get a bit of a, a digital divide? Um, I think there's some stats around online learning showing that that's, that is what's happening in the other sectors. Um, so it's just something to, that we've kind of seen. Um, and I had a specific question I just wanted to throw out there, which was around affiliate location and how important we think that is, because just in our booking system, we've, we've put it in, but I'm kind of concerned, it kind of disrupts the flow a bit if you choose virtual class, and then you've got to do affiliate location, and if, if we don't describe that really clearly, um, I think it might be a bit confusing. Is this, a, I think it's optional, but is this something we think we should be keeping in booking systems for now? Or if we took it out just to stop confusing people for now, would that be a big issue? Um, I mean, I'm tempted to say that given that it's optional, um, it really depends on your um, on your use case. Um, well, I guess that someone representing Active Westminster should probably say something about that because I think that's the reason that that use case is what exists. But I don't know whether, whether that whether that is relevant for open sessions. I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, like, I can't speak on behalf of uh, on behalf of Eugene, but speaking on behalf of regionally based clients, they, that being Active Partnerships and, and Westminster, um, or, uh, when the concept of being able to promote their local deliverers has come up, it's not something they'd have thought of themselves because that's too deep into our world for them to really have 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 gone through their brain. But the ability to do it is highly attractive. 
um, mm -hmm. if you are Westminster, supporting your local deliverers would would feasibly be a very high priority. We, we've included it, but we've we've managed we found the back end back end way to do it. We don't actually ask for a location, um, so we've simplified our flow without um, without sort of capturing capturing the data during activity creation. Um, but I, it would be valuable to to the consumers we're working with. Uh, how do you do that without asking location just out of interest? Take, take, taking the entity of the organisation they are. So if they are an, we, we capture it at their first first registration point rather than specific to the activity, uh, and then we know which part of the country they're in. Okay, that's useful to know. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. Um, thank you for all of that feedback. Uh, is there any other business arising? I will take silence as a no then. Um, and thank you very much all for contributing to this. Uh, I will aim to get this written up by the start of next week. Uh, thank you for your bandwidth, Nick, in both uh, personal and, uh, <laughs> and IT senses. And uh, I'll see uh, all of you in a couple of weeks, I hope. Thank you.